By 1000 BC, Babylon had established a lasting national state in the south. Meanwhile, the city of Asher dominated a similar rival state, Assyria, in the north. Soon, the region's rulers, like its desert sands, would undergo a remarkable shift. Babylonia will compete for power against North Mesopotamia, home to the ancient world's fiercest fighting machine, the Assyrians. The empires were getting bigger and bigger and more and more ruthless. The Assyrians, a Semitic people, had inhabited North Mesopotamia for at least 4,000 years. By the 9th century BC, their conquests extended far beyond Asher, the capital city and heartland of Assyria. From 885 to 860 BC, Assyrian king Ashur Nazirpal II was intensely focused on military matters. He wants to build up the power of Assyria. It had previously, several hundred years earlier, had been a major power. And Ashurnazirpal seems to have been determined to reinstate it as a major power. And the whole emphasis of the administration is on military matters. Ashurnazirpal's campaign set a standard for the future warrior kings of Assyria, who were ruthless, determined empire builders. The reliefs that are carved into the walls of the palaces of the Assyrian kings show siege engines ripping apart the walls of enemy cities. We see warships with battering rams on them. We see chariots. We see cavalry. We see infantry digging tunnels underneath the walls of the cities that they're besieging. The empires were getting bigger and bigger and more and more ruthless. The sadistic cruelty Asher Nazirpal inflicted on war captives and his own subjects protesting taxation was legendary. He would make a point of being as brutal as possible. He describes in gruesome detail flaying people, putting their skins on the wall of the city, making pillars of decapitated heads. Really horrible, gruesome stuff. According to scholars, he probably didn't do it everywhere. He would take one city and do it as an example and terrify everyone else into obeying. By the time of Ashur Nazirpal's death in 860 BC, his kingdom extended north to the borders of modern eastern Turkey and to the Mediterranean Sea. In the century following his reign, a lust to control Babylonia dominated the Assyrian monarchy. The Assyrian kings wanted to be king of the four quarters of the universe, or they wanted to be king of everything. Now, they didn't know how big the world was. Everything was them and Babylonia. And if Babylonia was outside of that, then they weren't king of the four quarters of the universe. So it, they needed, I think, perhaps to feel they controlled it. But the Babylonians, it seemed, had their own ideas about how they wanted to live. Babylonia refused to buy into Assyria as its overlord. And so was constantly breaking away. And Assyria tried a number of different things. They would put their own Babylonian king on. They would put the son of the Assyrian king on. The Assyrian king himself would be the king. Still, no matter what trouble was brewing between the two cultures, the Assyrians, ironically, always held the Babylonian civilization in high regard. Even though the Assyrians were all powerful, they still had a sense of cultural inferiority vis-a-vis -vis Babylonia. They saw Babylonia uh, as the source of uh, the best 
tablets, uh, real cuneiform culture, much as uh, in the 19th century, Americans might have looked to England as, you know, the place where you would find real English literature and drama and such. The Assyrians also felt a strong bond with the Babylonians. They spoke the same language. They worshiped the same gods. They wore the same clothes. This was a, a sister culture, but it was a much older sister culture, and it was one that they had tremendous respect for. But that changed beginning in 704 BC with the reign of the Assyrian king, Sennacherib. His army marched south several times to put down revolts in Babylonia. He initially set up a puppet king and that puppet king was removed. And then he put his crown prince on the throne of Babylon. This was his loved son. He, he was his eldest son. It was the man who was going to become king of Assyria after him. He was doing the Babylonians, presumably he thought, a great favor by blessing them with, with his son. In 688 BC, Sennacherib's son, Ashur Nadin Shumi, was captured and killed by an invading army. Sennacherib blamed the Babylonians for failing to protect and defend him. His relationship with the Babylonians got worse and worse. And in the end, he did what was unthinkable in a way, which was to go in and besiege Babylon. And he was brutal to it. But I pressed upon the enemy like the onset of a raging storm. I decimated the enemy host with arrow and spear. All their bodies I bored through like a sieve. I cut their throats like lambs. He destroyed the city. He burned down buildings, he razed temples. He took the statues of gods and had his soldiers destroy them. Now, this is complete desecration. It's, it's, it's sacrilege. Then he cursed the city. He said, no one can rebuild Babylon for 70 years. Sennacherib's actions angered the Assyrians, who believed Babylon's destruction invited the god's wrath. Even the king's own family disliked him. He was killed by his own son. And there are two stories about how he died. One was that he was stabbed. And the other one was that the son took one of those enormous statues of a bull and toppled it on his father. So he was crushed underneath this heavy, heavy stone sculpture. What a horrible way to go. Upon Sennacherib's death, his youngest son, Esarhaddon, became king of Assyria in 680 BC. Immediately, he wanted to rebuild Babylon and correct the huge mistake he believed his father had made. Yet he knew he would not outlive the 70-year curse re recorded for posterity on a clay tablet. Desperate, Esarhaddon consulted the priests and made a startling discovery. He discovered it wasn't 70 years after all, that they had been reading the tablet upside down. And in fact, it was 11 years, because the, in, the, in the way that numbers are written in cuneiform, 70, if you turn it upside down, is 11. And there it is. All they had to wait was 11 years. Esser Haddon ordered the city rebuilt. He used the spoils from his conquests to help finance the construction. When Esarhaddon died in 669 BC, he left his eldest son, Ashurbanipal, a kingdom that stretched from Egypt to Persia. Ashurbanipal was one of Mesopotamia's most cultured rulers and claimed a unique skill. He said, I, Ashurbanipal, who can read and write. And, um, he wanted to have a collection of all the literary works in his kingdom, and he wanted it to be in his palace at Nineveh. Ashurbanipal began sending agents to search out cuneiform tablets 
in the archives and schools of the Babylonian temples. His scribes then meticulously copied and cataloged some 20,000 of them before they were housed in what was the world's first library. Among the entire collection, though, Ashurbanipal especially valued more than 300 omen texts that he believed predicted the future. If the constellation Aries is faint, the king will encounter misery. If the stars of Orion sparkle, someone influential will get too much power and commit evil deeds. Most of the tablets had to do with the kinds of omen divination that was important for him if he was to rule properly in accord with the will of the gods and really survive as, as king. Ashurbanipal was not only a scholar, but also a military leader. Under his command, the Assyrian Empire controlled the entire Near East, the greatest land area ever in Assyrian rule. So for them, that was the universe, that was everything. But after Ashurbanipal's death in 627 BC, new power brokers would deliver crushing blows to the Assyrian Empire. These guys are forming a pincer's attack on the Assyrian heartland. <laughs> 